When you get into the world of enthusiast flashlights, it's not long before you come across Hank Wang's D4V2. It's kind of the gold standard for an enthusiast custom-built flashlight. Well, when Hank Wang announced he was going to release a 14500 size flashlight, that's kind of a double A sized battery, we all thought it was going to look like the Raylite Lanapple or Pineapple, which is, you know, a single emitter, it's got a reflector, and then a 14500 tube. What we didn't expect was what we actually got, which was the D2. This is Hank Wang's new 14500 size flashlight. It's a right angle dual optic 14500 light that disappears in your pocket. Welcome back to Shoe Lights. I gotta be honest, when Hank announced this light, I didn't get it at first. I looked at it and I just kept thinking, man, oh man, do I want something with a reflector and a single emitter. But now I get the genius of this light because it's a dual channel driver with dual optics and you can mix and match pretty much anything you want in there, but I'm gonna definitely give you some recommendations in this video. So let's dive in and take a look at just how small this guy is. So if we take a look against a Raylite pineapple or LAN, you can see that it is shorter. You can see that it is actually probably even a little smaller in diameter. And because of the fact, and here's the tail end, the tail end is pretty close, pretty similar. I might still give the edge to the D2 here, but the beauty of the fact that it's shaped at a right angle is that you're able to get two heads for the size of a single flashlight. So let's take a look against some other common flashlights. Here is a 18350 Custom, that's a Hanko. Here is the Olight Arkfeld. This is, of course, the UV version, and we'll look at that. And you know what? I'm even going to throw in a smaller flashlight. This is the Pineapple Mini. This is a AAA-sized flashlight, so that would be a 10440. And I want to point out that if you look at them, they're about the same length. And yeah, the 1440 is thinner, but I mean, you're going to get a much bigger battery in here with higher amperage and longer run time. I'd also like to point out that with a vape cell 14500 cell like that, I also found this flashlight to be incredibly lightweight. It's made of aluminum and anodized, but man, it feels like nothing. There's a battery in there right now, and I would swear that it was empty. It's that lightweight. It is 55 grams which compared to this titanium Raylite, it's 85 grams, and this one was also 85 grams. So these two are the same weight, and this one feels like, and it's pretty close to half the weight of these two guys. Let's talk about the shape and ergonomics really quickly. It is a right angle light, which isn't something I'm usually into, but man, it makes sense in this flashlight because of the fact it being a dual channel driver with two different optics, you can mix and match like I've done here with a TIR with a white light LED like the really awesome Nietzsche 519A, that's what I got in here. And then on this side, I've got a UV emitter with a reflector. Now that's not something you can easily do with you know flashlights like a D4V2 because this optic here, you know, let's say you put UV emitters here and you put, you know, 509 on this side. The problem is the optic, the uh, Carclo TIR in there is made out of PMMA, which is kind of a type of plastic that actually blocks blue light. So you can't use TIRs with UV. It's actually counterproductive and blocks the UV light. So you have to use either a mule, which is no reflector at all, or a mirrored reflector and that's what's under here now you can't see it because hank has thoughtfully installed what's called a zwb2 filter this is the ideal setup if you take a look at what olight has been doing with theirs they have a tir over here and you can see that's got the white emitter in it and then on the right here that you can see that there is a reflector there's a reflector right there just like i was talking about now they don't have the filter though and that's going to really affect the performance of this light compared to this one this this one's going to be much better for uv applications this button on top is pretty recessed not not like you got to dig in there but recessed enough that i just never accidentally 
activated it the whole time I had it and noticed it that I didn't put the uh, press on pocket clip onto the light here. Uh, I've just been dumping it straight into the bottom of my pocket and letting it kind of bounce around and it hasn't activated once. That's something that I've kind of had a love-hate relationship with Enduro lights, which is that it's easy to sometimes activate them in your pocket, and, you know, these things can get quite hot and burn a hole. So usually I would use lockout, which is, you know, four clicks. But I want to point out that I've never had to lock out this light, and it's never accidentally turned on. This is a great placement for the switch, and it doesn't activate accidentally, at least in my pocket. Now, if you want to go ahead and lock it out, uh, I still wouldn't do the four clicks. It's just a little bit cumbersome. I wanted to point out that the tail here, just turning it that much, so you can barely see, is enough to activate it. You see it flashed when I reactivated it. So watch, that much, it's done, and it's back on. So just a little twist is all it takes. It comes with an included press-on clip. You'd press it right into this channel right here like that, or into this channel down here like that, which is probably the smarter way to do it because then you get a nice deep pocket carry. Now, I'm not going to press it on because, you know, if I wanted to use this clip, it'd be no problem if I scratched up the anno by pressing it on. But it is pretty, pretty likely that when you push this on, you're going to kind of scratch up or chip the anno in that channel. So uh, don't just throw it on uh, if, unless you know that you don't care if you do that. I know that I don't often think to stick these to surfaces like this, except for the fact that now that it's right angle, one thing I often do is take the flashlight while I'm working and I want both my hands free, so I'll put it in my mouth to illuminate what I'm looking at, and that's just not working with this flashlight. So if you're a consummate mouth flashlight user like I am, this is a little frustrating at first because there's just no good way. I mean, I even tried like attacking it like a dog with a bone like this, and it was just super uncomfortable. So no real mouth use for this. So get that magnet and then go ahead and stick it to a surface. And before we get off the ergonomics, I also point out that like most Hank Wang flashlights, this has auxiliary lights that can just be fun or they can give you status of the battery. So let me go ahead and turn them on for a second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. So you can see that we got a little pink light glowing from the back of the reflector here. I turned down my video lights to make that clearer, but right now I have the auxiliary lights set to voltage check, so pink means it is fully charged. Once it drops below, I think 4.1, it uh, turns blue. But you can set those to any color you want, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you can see that as you hold the button down, It'll cycle through all the possible colors and you can just let up on the one you want or even let up on that one right there, which is called disco mode. And kind of an RGB light gamer thing. It probably makes my flashlight faster and get higher FPS. Now, there's also one that does this but slower. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that is voltage. Nope, there it is. I got it. So there you go. If you want all the colors, but you don't want to have a seizure at the same time, that might be the mode for you. Now, this is a, besides just being silly, this offers a pretty good solution to not being able to get tritium tubes right now. So you turn on these auxiliary lights and then you throw it on your bedside table and you're going to find this light at night. Also note that it's configurable before when the auxiliary lights looked like they were off, they were just set to low. So those are not really seen during the day when they're on low, but at night you definitely will be able to see them. I also want to point out just then that when I put it down, notice it rolls and stops. That is more genius to the shape of this light. Notice that this protruding little optic ridge here actually is an anti-roll device. And also notice, let me see if I can get a good shot of this. Look at these deep cutouts on the fins, really deep cutouts, which is excellent because on a lot of lights, those cutouts are just really aesthetic and they don't offer any additional surface area. But I feel like this really would help cool down this light. And this light can get quite hot when it's on turbo. One last thing I'll say about the auxiliary lights before we get to the battery section, and that is that the auxiliary lights on high like this, you can see that you can clearly see them, even with my video lights on, they are really bright. So if you want bright auxiliaries, awesome. However, if you leave the auxiliary lights on on high, 
expect the uh, pretty small, you know, double A sized 14500 cell, which usually is about 700 to 1000 milliamp hours, to be dead in about two weeks. So just know that the draw is pretty high. I mean, it's not drastically high. And if you're charging every couple days, probably wouldn't affect your world. But if you're going to, you know, use this as a storage thing, I definitely would either turn them off, mechanically lock it out, or at least put them on low. All right, let's talk about batteries and charging. Charging, I'll tackle first because it's easy. There is none. Hey, you get a light like this, you're an enthusiast. You should have a standalone charger. And if you want to see some great standalone chargers, you can check my channel for the SkyRC MC3000, which I think is great. There's no charging ports. Do it on your own. But the battery, we should take a look at. And the reason why is because the way this light is set up, it clearly needs a flat top unprotected cell for a myriad of reasons. One, this light puts out so many lumens on this tiny little cell that if there's a protection circuit, it's going to trip. This, you're going to think your light's broken, but really what's happening is it's requesting so much current that the protection cell is stopping the battery from delivering. So you need an unprotected cell. Now, I want to point out that even though this light, let me put this here so it doesn't roll, even though this light has a body tube you can remove here and it's got a spring on this end of the driver and a spring on the other end so you'd think there'd be lots of space in there for this battery there really isn't so the small threads go towards the head the long ends go towards the tail let me go ahead and just put this back together really quickly and show you why you need to get an unprotected cell for length reasons as well notice very here i got this backwards actually notice that the battery here, do you, can you see there? It's dented. It's dented on the end of this battery. And the reason it's dented is because that's how much pressure is being put on by both of these springs. And this is a short 14500. So a button top or protected cell will just simply physically not fit. And you have to crank this down all the way or it doesn't make contact. Now with one little, it's just a small gripe, but the threads are super long. Man, look at this takes a long time to get in there and out of there and it's kind of a bummer um so i thought about doing it from the head side but then the problem is with that spring pushing it's like hard to thread it and not cross thread it so i do not recommend going from the head side just put up with the long threads and i think part of the reason why that was done that way is so that you could th you know solve the problem i'm just talking about and that is thread it with absolutely no pressure at all because the spring hasn't contacted yet and then cinch that spring onto the battery. All right, now we're at the user interface section. Okay, and this is what I have to say about that. Go look it up. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not gonna cover Endural in this video. It's just way too complicated. But I will tell you this, if you are a flashlight fanatic, if you are an enthusiast and you want a crazy complicated light that does everything and you could set every little factor about it well then yeah this is a great ui for you but if you're somebody that falls in the category of i just want something that works and is kind of a little bit too much sometimes and i definitely would not recommend endural to first time enthusiast flashlight buyers or for gift giving if you're an enthusiast and you love Endural and you're like, hey, I'm going to get my family member that doesn't have any nice flashlights into flashlights, this is not the flashlight to start with. It is needlessly frustrating for people that don't want to sit down and memorize a complicated UI. But the last thing I want to say about the user interface is that this is a dual channel setup and when I receive the light, if I double click to turbo, both lights would come on at the same time because that's how the driver is set by the factory. But here's the thing, that is not good for a UV white light scenario. So I did disable that function. So now if you double tap, it goes to the top of ramp of the one emitter you're on only. If you wanna know how to do that, click on the link up here right now. I have a short video that shows you the clicks to go through. Let's talk about emitter tint and CCT, which in my case, I will talk about the one that came included with this light from Hank. I will not cover the myriad of options. See, folks, this light is built to order. 
You literally go to the website, which I'll show at the end of the video, and you select exactly which emitter you want, which CCT you want, all of that. So I can't give you all those options, but I will show you what I picked for this. And if I say so myself, I think I picked a very good option, which is, it is 519A, 4000K up here, and UV down here. And this is how the 519A, 4000 rates on turbo. So you can see it's just over 4000K and slightly rosy at negative 19. But look at those CRI values, man. Look at the R9, 92. I'll even give you the graph here. So you can see that the color rendition is off the chart. What a great emitter. If you're going to get a single emitter and a flashlight, I think the 519A4000 is ideal. It's just warm enough that it's not funky at night, and it's just cool enough that it's not funky during the day. I also want to point out that you can get anything you want in here, and I think that a lot of people, if they've never owned a dual driver, dual channel light, they're going to say, you know what, I should get something cool up here, something warm down here, then I can, you know, CCT and tint shift by mixing the two with the dual driver setup, the dual channel setup. But the fact of the matter is, I just don't find that very interesting. I, I never found it interesting, even really in a D4 V2 like this, because, you know, I just want all the emitters to be maximum efficiency and if you got some at 25 percent and some at like you know 80 percent that just doesn't seem very efficient also it just fiddly just get the uh temperature you like and just go with it right um i mean i i found that on the you know dual color setups i would just set them to where i liked it and then the light would just live there so why not just get those colored emitters in the first place now in addition to all that, I'm also going to point out that with a small battery like this, because this is not an 18500, man. This is a little tiny 1000 milliamp hour 14500. I think you really should drive it as one emitter only. I don't think you should go two emitters at the same time. You can, but just a lot of draw. So for me, I think that the UV and white light makes a lot of sense. So that's my recommendation. Uh, and as I said, if you want to go, you know, flood and throw or something, you want to go like, you know, a Samsung up here for maximum flood and a W1 down here for maximum throw, that is fine. But remember that you're only basing how much candela you get off the size of the phosphor surface of the emitter. The optic is not changing. You know, there's just one sized optic for each side. So um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to go flood and throw. And I don't, and as I said, the color mixing isn't a big thing for me. So uh, just go with this. The last thing I want to say about emitter performance, which maybe this could even go in the beam shot section, is that if you look closely, let me get a really good focus on this. There we go. Maybe you can see, let's see if we can get that there. Maybe. Can you see that there is a leg right here? I'm talking about the optic inside, inside the silver. There's a leg right there, 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 and there. There's four legs on corners. Now, most optics have three legs, and they're, you know, about 120 degrees apart. With it being 90 degrees apart like this, um, it, it actually kind of makes an interesting beam shape. I don't know if I can capture it with all the light on. Maybe a little bit. Hopefully you can see that it's a little bit squared off. Get a little bit of a square shape. Now, it's only really a problem when you are really close like I am right now. So when you come really far back, it just becomes a circle again. But just note that that's not a defect. It's just the shape of the legs on the optic. At least that's what I'm inferring from looking at it. I The optic itself is perfectly round. The glass is round. It's these legs, I think, are causing shadows at the corners. All right, let's talk about the beam shape. So this guy is about as floaty as you'd expect the reflector in a pineapple mini to be. So if I put this at about the same height each... Let's see, get the head. There we go. The heads are about the same height now. You can see that the circles are about the same. I would say that the Pineapple Mini is a little narrower. This is a little floodier. But if you look at, let's say, a full-sized LAN or Pineapple, this guy, this guy is a lot pointier, a lot throwier. So you're going to get about well, six to 700 lumens, depending on your emitter, out of this light. 
and you get about 450 to 500 depending on what you're doing over here. The driver here seems to be driving the emitter a little bit harder than the driver in the LAN or the pineapple. But, you know, this one is going to go farther despite being lower lumens because it's higher condolence, more concentrated. Now, with a light this size, with one that doesn't have a huge battery, doesn't have huge lumens, I'm actually going to argue that I like the beam on this one more. And the reason why is because I would never carry this for an, a, an outside walking light. I mean, you could, but I mean, there's better lights for that. So to me, this is something that I throw in my pocket for working, right? And so that's how you get the magnet, you stick it to things. And if you're working up close, you want a floody beam. So I think the beam's perfect. All right, we're at the lumen tube here. Let's take a quick look at the low it does, which is, you know, third of a lumen. Let's go to turbo, and we're at uh, over 600 lumens, and I didn't even hit right when it first came on. So let me see if I can hit that peak again. Yeah, well, right about 600 lumens. Now, like most lights this size, it's going to struggle with heat, but notice that it's dropping pretty slowly. I mean, this is a regulated light, fully regulated throughout the whole range. And so it's struggling with heat and efficiency and also sag on the battery. But, you know, you can see that we're almost 30 seconds right now. We're almost ANSI. And it went from 610 to 530. That's super respectable for a light this size. And after that much time, you know, it is pretty toasty here on the head. I mean, I can hold it. It's not going to burn me or anything, but you know, you know it, you know, it's been on. Now let's take a look at the UV side of this. I wanted to show you something really quickly here. Let's talk about the output between this D2 and the Arcfeld UV here. Now there's no real good way to measure UV because I got the UV on right now and you can see that nothing measures because these light meters just don't pick up UV like that. So what I've got here is I got a little glow cap and I am going to put the glow cap in there and then shine the UV in there. It's going to be a little fiddly, but it, it will give us a ballpark figure on what's going on. So let's put that in there. Let's put this in here. Turn it on. You can see that I'm getting about 24 lumens. 24 lumens. And that's not to say the UV is 24. That's just what I'm getting with this contraption. Now let's go ahead and convert this UV to white light. And you can see we're getting about, about 52, 52. So, I mean, it's a lot brighter on turbo. Now, it does get hot, whereas this one didn't. So, this one might have been undercranked, whereas the D2 definitely is an enthusiast, you know, hot rod here. But, um, you know, there you go. Uh, if you want a UV output, I would definitely go with the D2. Okay, let's take a look at the UV performance really quickly here. Um, there's lots of things to look at with UV light and I'll have description in the video here, uh, the description of all the different items you can look at under UV. There's so many, but I think that in my day to day, the things that I'm going to look at with UV the most are documents because a lot of UV ink is used on documents to make sure that they're official. Um, let's take a look at my, uh, wallet from Pulp Fiction here. All right, so I got the lights turned pretty darn low just so that you can see a lot of fluorescence. And notice that when I hit this here, this is going to be, hopefully you're going to be able to see this, that there's a little V, a little V right under the visa. So that's without the light. And when I pass it over, you can see that little V show up. So that's not amazing. I'll show you some better ones. Here is a Disneyland pass holder card. Okay. So if I take the UV light and pass it over to the front, I don't see anything too special. And then when I turn it over, you can see that it looks completely white. But right here, if I turn it on, you can see that there's some ink that says Disneyland right there. Now, one of the documents uh, besides a passport that is just rife with stuff is a driver's license. And I will point out that um, on my picture here, which is covered up, but if I go like this, there's literally glow in the dark numbers of my driver's license. Let me see if I can just peel this back a little bit and show you. So there's all kinds of features on this thing. So let's see here. There you go. There's some numbers. You can see some of the numbers on my license. Okay. Now, I also want to point out that the picture 
you know, there's a color picture here, a little dot matrix picture here, and then there's another little UV picture of me right there. And this isn't a UV thing, but I'll just show you that if I go to white light, on my license at least, in my state, if I shine through the back, right there, let's see here, let's get like, there we go. You can see there's a little bear, a little bear for California State. Now let me try and show you the difference between the UV in these two lights here. Um, so I'll use this glow in the dark cap here. Switch this one onto UV, turn it on, and you can see that's kind of a, you know, you can see where the hot spot is. You can kind of tell as I pass it across, right? It's pretty floody. Now let's look at the D2. Can you see that it's like more concentrates, more like a laser beam? It's like you're on it or you're off it. So I'd say the hot spot is just about that size. And I wasn't that far away, so if you come further back, it's going to get bigger, obviously. But I just want to point out that I think that candela is actually really nice because that way when things are further away, you can illuminate them better. And uh, well, I'll just go side by side real quickly here. You only had one level of UV on the arc field. You can also see that there's some like stuff going on on my table here. You see over here, there's like weird little rings from probably a nio gel or something. And if I switch over to the D2, you can see how concentrated the beam is. So if you want to flood a UV, the D2 is not it, um, but I, I find it better. I find it brighter and more interesting than the arc field, okay? All right, let's do some beam shots. I was thinking about doing beam shots outside, and then I thought, you know what? It's a work light. We should do beam shots inside. And so let's first start with the arc field UV against the D2. Arc field will be in my right hand here. There you go, that's on turbo. So it's a really floody light. In fact, the Arkfeld UV is even floodier than other Arkfelds. It's got a smaller reflector. Now let's take a look at the D2. And you see it's very similar, actually. So here, here's the Arkfeld on the right. Here is the D2 on the left. I would say the D2 is even a little floodier. But again, I don't have a problem with that because if this is a close-up work light, that's perfect. Let's take a look now at the pineapple or the lan apple from Ray, which is going to be throwier than the D2 here. So let me click on the Ray light, and you can see that it's got a concentrated hot spot, and then as I bring the beam down, you can see the spill right there. So it's got a really wide spill with a concentrated hot spot compared to the D2. The D2 has a giant spot, and as I bring it down, you will see that there is a edge to the spill right there. See the edge right there as I go up and down? Right there. So much floodier the D2 than the pineapple. You can see it in low, how concentrated that hot spot is. And you see how floody that one is. I feel like the best comparison, if you have one, is kind of what the pineapple mini looks like. So the Pineapple Mini, you can see that the hot spot is pretty much from the top of my garage door to the bottom, and then there's spill in a really wide area there. You can see the spill, but it's the hot spot's about that big. And the D2 is floodier than that. You can see that from there down to here maybe. So it's wider, but I'm just saying, if you want a pretty good usage case, of a light you own, I think that it's definitely more analogous to a Pineapple Mini, which everyone seems to have a Pineapple Mini, right? Pineapple Minis are great. So, oh, I'm having trouble with my reverse cookie here. Here we go. Pineapple Mini versus the D2. I think they're pretty similar, but note that the D2 is even floodier than the Pineapple Mini. Let's see a real world use case here for finding things with UV. So if I turn the arc field on, and you can tell it's really floody. And let's see here. You can see some things are illuminating on the light, on the bikes here, and on the wall, that panel in the back is kind of illuminating. Now let's take a look against the D2 here, and you're gonna see how much better the D2 is. Check this out. Look at that. That's because the D2 has just so much more throw. It's way more concentrated. So if you're looking for spots on carpet or walls or something. I mean, you're just gonna get much more intensity. 
And then also, if you're looking just for features on a document like a driver's license, that extra candela, you're really gonna see it during the day. But I think that the arc filled UV's floodiness is going to make it harder to see those features. During my testing of this light, and then thinking in my head what I wanted to say during the review, I kept thinking, okay, there's so much to talk about, but be succinct, get in, get out. And I didn't want this video to be too long, and here it is, super long. And the reason why is because you just can't talk about a light this complicated without just spending a lot of time. So I'm sorry about that, folks, but I do want to point out really quickly that where you order them, so if you go to Hank Wang's website here at internationaloutdoor.com, so I'll put that in a title at the bottom of the screen here. So it's international-outdoor.com, and international is I-N-T-L. Now, you're going to search, or maybe it's just on the main page right now, but you can do the search option and put in D2 and go looking for it. Three things come up. It's the new one, the MSR D2. Starts at about 45 bucks. But, you know, options are going to change the price. And what should you get? Well, get the tube you want. I don't really think you should get the stone white. I mean, it looks cool, but it's a dirt magnet and it chips easier than the colors. Uh, this red looks amazing. I didn't choose the red. He just sent it to me, but it looks great. Uh, and by the way, I did not pay for this light. Uh, Hank just sent it to me so I could review it for you guys. But, you know, I've owned over 40 of his lights that I have purchased. So I love the guy. I, he, he makes great lights. You can choose the backlight color. On this one, the backlight color is warm white. But you can see, whoops, I'm on the wrong selection. You got all those different options there. And it's just aesthetics. You do not have to worry about what you pick there. Now, on channel one and channel two, he says closest to the switch or further from the switch. So this would be channel one right here. This is channel two. Now on this pull down, you have a bunch of different options for emitters. Mine is the 519A4000, at least according to what I asked for and what he wrote on the box right there. But uh, I don't see it on his list. So there's two options going on here. One option is that he has some 4,000 in stock. It's just not listed. So if you order something similar, like you order, let's say, 4,500 with the dome, buy it, so pay for it and everything, then send him an email at contact at internationaloutdoor.com, and then just tell him you want the 4,000s instead. He'll just make that change. Um, and then on the second option here, if you go all the bottom, you will see the UV with ZWB2 filter. Now, it costs an extra 10 bucks, but such an awesome thing, I'd get that. Notice that you do have an option of two different optics. The It's basically the clear optic you see here. The, I would call it the normal optic. And he says spot, but it's pretty normal. It's not that, it's not that throwy, right? And then there's a frosted optic, which gets even floodier. But honestly, you know what? I just get the clear one. And if you wanted floodier later, just put some DC fix over the optic and then just peel it off when you're done. So um, I think I would get the clear all day long. And then definitely get that magnet in the tail cap for another two bucks. Once you do all that, you're set and you can order it. This is a phenomenal light. And honestly, my new favorite pocket UV light. Just don't see a reason that I'd ever carry this Arkfeld now. Uh, just because this has better performance and better color rendition. All right, folks. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.